Hello, I'm Gary Allen, your host for today's project. This house really needs some clean out and prep before it receives a designer's landscape. Our third load of removal of debris from the property, and we haven't even begun on the backyard yet. Some unwanted leaves, we stripped off the old sod, as well as some old existing plants that have come out. Uh, this is really our new picture here, uh, a, a new design of a semicircle driveway with a double entry here into the front door. So we look forward to changing the whole picture here. As the driveway, the circular drive goes to the street, it was actually recessed down into the grade and so we're ending up with a couple feet high at the road that we need to excavate. We have spent all morning stripping out the old grass in order to bring this down. I'll show you what an area we've saved that we have yet to do, and we're a couple feet up here. Again, the driveway for proper drainage and to meet the curb line has come down here and been recessed. Now we're making our adjustments. Uh, we even have to redo the sprinkler system in order to get water through here because the pipes weren't buried deep enough. So really, we've stripped all that out. Short side of the property here to the neighbors, and you can see, well, on me, there's not much on me from the knees down, but that's a couple feet that has to be taken off of here. And as you look back, this existing oak tree, we've got to be careful. We've got some exposed roots that have been cut, you know, by the guys that did the driveway. So we might spend some time talking about that. What's the best thing we can do for that oak tree there? But you can see, again, we'll bring this down, make use of our fill dirt, even before we consider bringing sod and plants in to rebuild. Now we've still got a little bit of grading to do and we're working on the sprinkler system, uh, but I thought I would at least get a game plan for where our bed lines are gonna go and the turf lines. And I think we'll have plants all out here. My goal is trying to link up the planting by the house here with that of the circular drive or the semi-circle island we've got. How can we make sense or link them together? And we talk about crossing over the driveway or sidewalk and that's what we'll do here push right into this direction. That takes us into our island here. And I wanna continue in a, about where I left off there. And I'm gonna radius out and come around with a big kind of thumb bed around these two meter boxes. And then I'm gonna head back towards you. Again, I'm in the bed line. So we don't wanna to get too narrow here. But the object is that turf will move here, turf grass here, and I think a complementary bed at the street is going to help us. In other words, let's see if we can show you by adding a little bed out here at the street. Doesn't that complement our movement here? So you, can you visualize grass continuing all the way through and around this island planting with a tree or so? And so now I think I need another complimentary bed that'll work this side of the semicircle. So um, let me use the half circle concept. And I'll mimic another one over there. So planting and grass through here. Can you see that?
Well, you join us now another day later and our sod is installed as well as some trees. So let's talk about that. Do you remember the bed patterns that we drew out here? Wouldn't you say that we pretty much achieved those lines? There's one challenging point of interest is how we're going to cross or get, get our plants to really take this semicircle island into here. So we need something colorful there. Do you remember the sago palm that was here that had about three trunks on it? If you look back behind me, we've installed it on the wall and broken up those heads. And really we have now one, two, three, and we're using the wall as a nice silhouette for that look. Uh, I really feel like the Sago is in a better position. Instead of kind of hiding the front door now, it's over here into three different plants and it can do its thing. Well, again, I talk about this crossing over. As we enter this semicircle area, I, I've got to impress this upon you. Instead of having a hedge or something to lock us out from the driveway, Look at the feeling, the entrance here, the motivation to move you through this area. And that's what the turf grass or the beds do. Over here, we've got these two semicircle areas that we need to use similar plants on to kind of pull them together visually. And then I want you to take note of the holly trees here, the East Palatka holly. We have used the same tree and repeated it three times, not three different specimens. We want continuity continuity and unification here. And as you travel around the circular drive or past the house, your attention is brought into the circular drive rather than holding you out. So that's the impression. Whether these are oaks, magnolias, or hollies in this case, it's the same specimen repeated for continuity. Now we've got a live oak over here that we really need to talk about. I'm afraid the concrete driveway has really caused a negative impact on one of our existing trees. And to really talk about that with us today, Early Piety, a certified arborist Hello, with Gary. specialty tree surgeons. Nice to have you out. Thank you. Uh, tell us, I mean, the damage was really done when we got here, but what, what can we do for this tree or what's the problem? Well, there's been a major root impact here. <clears throat> According to what you told me, this, the level of the ground used to be about here. Yes, sir. All the way across into that other yard over yes, there across sir. the driveway. And now all of this has been taken down. Well, that severely impacts the root system of this tree because the root system of this tree is fairly shallow, 12 or 14 inches max, and you can see that's about the cut. So these roots have been torn off and ripped and exposed to all types of pathogens that can get in there, and they're injured. Uh, anything that you can do to it now would be just kind of to to pack the wound, as it were, and the way you'd want to do that would be to put some pine mulch or some type of mulch in here and cover these roots up and let them begin the healing process. Oh, okay, that's what we have planned for this area. We've made a bed, a natural bed, so that maybe a few border grass or something with a, a, a pretty shallow root system itself right. would help cover. And then as mulch, we install mulch and the leaves fall and drop here. Hopefully that'll help the organic matter process. Or the leaves from this tree is one of the best things you can put around here because that's the way Mother Nature designed it. Very good. The leaves need to go back into the ground into decomposition to re-nourish the tree and as that goes on the tree will begin to heal itself. Uh, as you look up at the canopy do you any damage uh, so far? I mean it's been a couple months since they poured the driveway. You won't be able to see any damage on these trees because of the time frame trees are on. We are on a 24-hour cycle. We eat and sleep and drink every 24 hours. That's one day to us. Okay. One day to a tree is one growing cycle or one year. All right. So if this, the, if this damage uh, is, is hurtful enough to this tree that it shows the classic staghorning effect of construction damage and it takes it a while, well it's going to take it three or four years or in the tree's case it only means three or four days. Okay, so you might not see a, a right away visible evidence right. of, of Next summer when the hot weather comes is when perhaps it'll start die back and then the following summer it will be worse and then maybe by the third summer it'll begin to catch up and heal itself. Mm -hmm. So four or five years down the road it might look like this again. Okay. So, so far it still looks good, but now the ripping and tearing we talked about here, uh, how do you avoid that? If, if you're installing this driveway or you're out here, what are you going to do to avoid that? Well, you should never cut a root with a backhoe. <laughs> That's the wrong way to cut a root. What we should have done in this case was if we know that we've got to get rid of this part of the root system, we should have come in here with a stump grinder that would have cleanly cut the roots at this level here. A nice vertical line. A nice vertical so line deep, so huh? that these roots back here were still intact and unharmed, although they were cut off. But when you cut them off with a backhoe, you can see that you have ripped and torn yes. severely in here mm -hmm. and also when you pull it with the backhoe it also makes the root spring up toward the root collar area in here and that's very detrimental to a tree. Well, see that's why some of these parts or fragments are even loose or coming out here so what, what you're saying you've you've vibrated it, it loose maybe all the way to the trunk here. Sure. Mm -hmm. 
Sure. And all of these are the transport routes. These are the big routes that move the nutrients and the water up and down the tree. And the small feeder routes are these things up here. That's where the feeder routes are. They come off of these so that they come up to the top of the decomposing matter to absorb, be, to absorb the decomposing matter sure. down into these roots, over to these roots, up to the tree for photosynthesis and back out here for storage. Mm -hmm. So not only are the transport routes gone, but all of the feeder routes are gone up in this area and over in that area too. Well, you know, uh, again, getting here after the fact, there's not too much we can do, but at least you've helped us appreciate what type of stress the tree is going through and what we can do for the long haul. Right, and in the long haul, you want to treat this just like if you were in a bad car accident. You'd, you'd lay low, you'd stay in intensive care, you'd get plenty of rest and lots of fluids. So you need to put extra water on this tree so that what roots are left can compensate for the root loss and need to put mulch on there so the roots will calm down the tree can begin to heal itself. Okay, well, we thank you for your visit. I tell you, it's a beautiful tree. It's a nice looking live oak and it's been maintained over the years. It's been trimmed out and it's a very lovely tree, probably maybe 30 years old and it's got a long time to go if it can get over this. Very good. Early, uh, during our renovation of the backyard also, I've noticed a, a tree back here that has a different type of stress. I hope you could help us out there. Well, this is a water oak, and uh, looking up in it, you can see a lot of clumps of mistletoe in it. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think that you've got to take the mistletoe out of the tree or it'll kill it, and that's not necessarily true. But mi mistletoe is a plant parasite. It is a known parasite, is and it, it will eventually kill the tree. But that's not to say that it's going to kill it next week or tomorrow. Judgment it, it, call. It, yeah, it, it's just a judgment call. You know, trees have been living with mistletoe for a very long time, okay. and they seem to know how to put up with it. The book says if you want to get mistletoe out of a tree to cut back three feet from the infected area. Well, if you cut back three feet from every piece of mistletoe in this tree, you effectively would have a big stub left, yeah. so you wouldn't want to disfigure the tree. That's true. Uh, the, the thinking now is that you just leave the tree alone and let it live with the mistletoe and it, the, the, the two will get along together. Sometimes a mistletoe blight will come by and every piece of mistletoe in it will die. I've hmm. seen that happen. Hmm. And uh, other than that, the tree will just live with it for a very long time. Uh, well, I know even as a kid, you know, you always think mistletoe is a, is a bonus. Once you are able to recognize it uh, during the fall or the winter when trees lose their leaves, that's when you notice the green pockets of mistletoe mm -hmm. in a deciduous specimen like this. But there was so much of it here. Uh, maybe you can help us really understand that we say it's a plant parasite, mm -hmm. but what does that mean according to this tree and the mistletoe itself? The, the mistletoe actually is a plant that lives in the tree bark. It has a seed that lays on the limb and then the seed begins to grow just like in the ground and it penetrates into the cambium layer and puts the roots of the mistletoe into the vascular system of the tree. So it gets its nutrients directly from the tree. That makes it a parasite. That makes it a parasite, that's mm -hmm. right. And something else I've noticed up here is all these vines on this tree. Uh, this is English ivy and it was planted and it probably looked very nice for a while, but it's gotten completely out of hand. And it adds to the tree uh, a lot of weight and a lot of things that the tree doesn't need to put up with. It's not a parasite. It's not taking anything from the tree, but it's adding so much extra burden to the tree that it needs to be removed. Uh, even moisture that would be held it, in around the trunk or the limbs? When it rains, Every leaf surface on there carries a certain amount of weight of sure. water, and when that gets wet, that's tremendously heavy, and also it doesn't let the tree dry out, okay. and so it keeps a, a, a condition in there where you could get a fungus, a fungus that would growing on the bark that would kill the tree. Mm -hmm. Also, say if that tree was hollow and needed to be removed, how would we see that? We couldn't see it. It's hiding what might be wrong with the tree. So yeah. removal of the vines is the thing to do. Or either pick a, a height line and keep it maybe trimmed or maintained to that sure. at least. Sure. If you could, uh, yeah, waist high or head high so you could maintain it. Nothing wrong with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, again, good tips for the future to know how the mistletoe or the vines in this case are or could be affecting the overall health of this right. tree. Right. You need to treat all trees basically like Mother Nature treats the trees, which would mean don't let the vines get up in there and leave the mistletoe alone. Okay. Well, as you can see, our plants have arrived to the job site, and it really gives us an opportunity to talk about a few varieties that we don't normally use or get to use too often. Here in front of you is the Camellia, Camellia japonica, a beautiful plant and really a glossy green leaf. You see the japonica has a larger leaf than the sasanqua. This cultivar is Rosa plana, a beautiful reddish pink bloom. You see, and these are budding up, so it won't be long before they'll be opening into the landscape. And some cultural characteristics about the Camellia, a slow grower. These will get 15 to 20 feet 
takes quite a while for that to happen. But in the meantime, we're thinking uh, characteristics as far as temperature. You look at the specs, uh, down to around zone 8 for us. And as well as that, we want filtered sun or part shade for this plant so that uh, it won't burn in the full sun foliage. Again, I mentioned a slow grower. We'll use this as a specimen uh, to accent the landscape. And when these bloom, uh, there's nothing like it. Now let's move on to a new patented variety. This is Liriope gigantea. And usually the species name is uh, descriptive. In this case, gigantea would mean that it's a large growing. This is called super green giant. Now I love the, I first thought it was an Ophia pogon. You see the thin hair-like linear foliage, but it is a Liriope, but this beautiful dark green, almost a blue-green color, if you will, will look good in the landscape. And as I check the tag here, I see PPAF, that probably means, I'm gonna take a guess, plant patent applied for. So propagating this plant is restrictive to the grower only who has the patent. So isn't that interested? When we see new varieties come on, really, uh, they're mostly kept by those who hold the patents there. Uh, take a look too at our an azalea, an azalea that's blooming, the fashion azalea. Uh, kind of a shrimp color flower, if you will. Uh, you can tell by the leaf size that this is not a large grower. And so we call it a medium azalea, but it blooms not only in the spring, but for us here in the fall, at least getting two types or two blooms a year. One thing to note about our fashion azalea, again, is that it's not a large grower, not a dwarf. We call it kind of a medium, and that'll help its size in the landscape, and it can be shaped very well. Now, even though it's a, a shade grower as azaleas go, it can take more light, too. Just a little bit of partial sun can be fine. Now let's turn our attention to a beautiful, low-growing juniper, uh, Junipers chinensis. Uh, procumbens. Very tight, compact growth habit. Well, you can tell. Look how it's barely above the, the pot or the bucket. Six to eight inches height all, all together and is a spreader. I, love the, I like the blue color as well. And this will help mix into the landscape um, to provide that bluish cast that we use. Uh, see, landscape plants, you've got green, yellow green, the variegation that's behind me, as well as this is kind of a medium or a yellow green and the blue or blue green that we have. Well, with our bed patterns somewhat set and established now, what plants will we use in order to create a colorful presentation? Well, we begin really with that one major concern of linking the driveway together, this major bed. Uh, I don't know if you've observed that we really break the rules here. We don't really think that you need to follow a rule as far as start with your taller plants up around the house and come outward. Matter of fact, as a designer, my mind works. I go with, with what I know I need to work on first. Remember, we talked about trying to initiate this primary uh, point, and that is we've used the Aztec grass to pull us together. And then the low procumbens juniper here as a good color contrast to also make that link. Now, when we turn our attention back here to our right, you see this circular pad or island. Well, it's kind of a standalone, and we had a tree in here, one of the hollies, but with the ligustrum right here behind us, it, it was just getting too cramped. So we pulled our tree out into the semicircle drive. And uh, to avoid this from being standalone, I went ahead and stripped it or lined it with the low juniper so we have this complement, so to speak, coming down the drive or the walk here to the house. And I'll take the opportunity to link this plant-wise with the driveway across here. And also, don't forget the bed behind me. I can use plants up front and in the back to kind of tie that in together also. Well, the blue-green juniper, the variegated Aztec. What do you say we find a burgundy foliage that'll give us more contrast? When I think of burgundy foliage, uh, two plants come to mind, the little John azalea and the lower petalum we have here. With this variegated color and to get some contrast or separation, We'll use them in a curved pattern. Remember, we had the big sago here that was kind of doing his thing. Now, instead of a square or a corner, we're going to use this rounded off nature, if you will. Uh, you can see the extension of the risers here from the existing shrubs, the big boxwood we had. This guy in particular, he's just too far out of the ground, so I can work him down a little bit. Uh, this 18-inch Schedule 80 riser 
will come right off of here. And this is the nozzle with the spray head. So I can loosen that and really save this guy for the future. Put him right in place, making sure my spray pattern is in the right direction. And we'll fine tune or adjust these as we go. When we get done, we wanna make sure that we've got that complete coverage that we're looking for. Uh, something worth noting, look at this potted plant, an evergreen giant liriope. You know, a lot of times people are looking for that ideal plant to put into a situation like this. Uh, I guess the contribution would be that this plant is low maintenance. They've really never pruned it. And you see how it just takes on a natural shape of cascading over the, over the container. Again, a perfect application here. Um, if you're thinking about a potted plant for a situation like that, you don't always have to go with something big and bulky. Even a dwarf or ground cover plant can work to, to be a low specimen. Now, if you'll take a look at the lower petal of my setup in here, again, rounding out the corner like we mentioned, I think what we'll do is bring some of this bluish green harbor dwarf Nandina in. So we're gonna come down. In other words, uh, the variegated Aztec, we come up to the lower pedalum, and then we're gonna knock down another step or notch here because um, the lower pedalum will be the tallest plant. We don't wanna take over or hide this little brick walk. What we put in the planter, we'll have to take on that straight shape. But I like this. Again, we're staying low so that we can read all this and it'll have presentation basically year round. So to break the straight line concept, I've run the Harbor Dwarf Nandina in a curve here and then tucked in the giant border grass, the super giant right here on a radius and then run it up into the planter box so that our plant there is not in a straight line like the planter box. We've kind of broken out of it, if you will, and give it a little bootleg, a little 3D, if you will. Uh, well, as we begin to wind down, so to speak, let's show you some other things we did in some other parts of the yard. The camellias here we've used at your right and at your left uh, for some privacy, but we've left things open in the middle with the Aztec so that we don't have a complete wall. Wouldn't you agree that the curved bed lines and patterns here create that flow that we're looking for? When we reflect back on what we had here, nothing but dirt to begin with, and then really you can see that the complementary bed patterns here, how they reflect, I think the renovation speaks for itself. What do you think about our semicircle island? Well, when I go back and look at the befores here, we had nothing but an open flat palette. Now we've got curves, flow, direction, and a colorful landscape year round. What do you say you go back now and enjoy some more before and afters? Use a curve or two. You'll appreciate it. I'm Gary Allen. I'll see you soon.